Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Skinwalker encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash dark and creepy. Never shoot a skinwalker. My two buddies and I went on a hunting trip for bull elk last November and we were having a great time, to say the least. That however soon would change after what we saw on the third day. Now I'm not one for superstition and I don't believe in ghosts at all but what we saw out there really changed my view about those sorts of things. The trip started out normally after we parked our trailers at camp. We got there a day early before the hunt officially started so we could settle in and get some scouting done. Only Eric and I had licenses because Brian didn't draw out this year but he wanted to come along with us anyway. Brian also brought along his German Shepherd named Lucy which stayed back at camp with a leash that was connected to a metal spike. The spike was so deep in the ground that I wondered if we would be able to get it out. I asked Brian and he just told me that his dog was so strong that it had to be that deep. I enjoyed playing with Lucy. She was always excited to see me and would greet me by jumping up on two legs and trying to lick my face. Eric, however, was not amused by her and would constantly yell at her to leave him alone. Anyway, the first two days we saw so many cow elk in valleys and on sides of the mountains, that I thought for sure we would see some bulls out there but there were none among them. It wasn't until the third day of the hunt that we saw a bull elk, but it was too far away to take a shot at. And even if we were able to hit it, it would take hours trying to pack that thing out. So that evening we decided to hunker down next to some fallen trees and were able to watch a hillside. While we were surveying the area, Brian spotted a coyote about 250 yards walking to a small pond of water strangely as if it was maimed. Eric took out his binoculars to take a closer look and he started to describe it saying, that coyote. It ain't right looking. It has a hunch on its back like a bear, and its jaw. Oh man its damn jaw seems like it's been broken and now it's just drooping there like a dead fish. Let me see those beanos, I asked curiously with an outstretched hand. Eric handed them to me and as he did he seemed to grasp his gun tightly. I took them and looked at the animal and said, you're right, that thing's jaw is just hanging there. Also, did you happen to notice its hair, it's so long and unevenly dispersed. I then handed the binoculars to Brian and he looked at the coyote for one second and screamed. Shoo, Brian shut up. We're hunting. Eric whispered harshly. What did you see? I asked as I looked at his shocked facial expression. Brian looked at his feet as he muttered, I saw my dog Lucy, but it wasn't her. I don't know what that was. It couldn't have been your dog. When I looked at it, it looked like a dying coyote. It didn't have the large black spot on its back or your dog's strawberry red sides and underbelly. I said in a plain yet confused manner. Well since we ain't gonna see anything out here cause you screamed like a baby, I'm going to put that coyote out of its misery, Eric said angrily as he raised his rifle and looked through the scope. A large shot followed and we saw the animal drop down soon after. It was a clean kill and Eric was curious about seeing what was wrong with the animal up close so he started getting ready to hike out. As he got his stuff together he said, you probably just didn't get a good look at it, Brian. Your dog is fine. Brian stood up and as he brushed the dirt off his but he replied, I swear I saw my dog but an evil demented version of it with human eyes, but you guys are probably right. There's no way she could have had the strength to yank out the metal stake holding her back at camp. Well let's go find out the truth about this animal, 
I said somewhat excitedly as I started walking toward the dead animal. It took us about half an hour to hike over to it and we lost sight of the animal's corpse as we had to pass through some trees. Once we finally got to the spot where the animal had dropped there was no corpse, just a puddle of blood. However, the blood was blackish and very dense. Eric observed the scene and started to scratch his head as he said, I could have sworn I shot that thing straight through its heart. There's no way it could have just gotten back up and walked off. I had an eerie feeling about the whole situation and Brian was still afraid that it might have been his dog that got shot. Eric, however, noticed a trail of blood leading into a dark tree line. Without asking he started to follow it and he loaded his gun. As he did me and Brian were both freaked out and just watched Eric as he went into the forest. He soon went out of sight and Brian and I could not leave him here so we waited. I passed the time by taking a skinny stick and poking at the puddle of blood. It smelled terrible and the aroma hit me pretty hard, so much so that my stomach convulsed and I threw up. You okay? Brian asked as he put his hand on my back. Before I could answer there was a loud shot that echoed through the trees and we both looked at the direction it came from. Must have found the animal, I said as I spit into the grass. As soon as I said this we could now see Eric but he was full on sprinting. Run! He screamed as he ran at us. I noticed that he had must have dropped his gun because he wasn't carrying it. I was about to ask him what happened but Brian grabbed my arm and yanked me towards where we had parked the truck. Without hesitation, I ran. We soon made it back to the truck and my shoulder hurt from the rubbing of the gun strap. I looked back at Eric who slowed down for nothing. I soon looked behind him and saw nothing chasing us. So I opened the truck and got in without worry. Eric then climbed in and told me to hit the gas and go. I was so perplexed on what Eric saw out there and I knew that he hardly ever got scared of anything so this started to freak me out. I started driving fast back to camp and I asked Eric, what did you see out there that was scary enough to make you drop your gun? I don't know man, that was no damn animal. I followed the trail of blood and it stopped at the base of a tree and I was wondering how a coyote was able to climb a tree but when I looked up I saw this hairy humanoid creature there. It smelled so freaking bad. Eric went on about how scary that thing was and how he was done with the hunting trip and wanted to go home. We soon pulled into camp and mutually decided that we were going home. I started to pack my things and then felt like something was missing. I then thought to myself, Lucy. Where is Brian's dog? She usually always is so excited to see us back at camp she can't stop barking and whining to be set free. As soon as I thought this Brian started screaming and crying. I ran over to where he was and saw that his dog was gone. However, on further inspection, I noticed what Brian was looking at. Something had pulled out the metal stake in the ground and strung Lucy up on a nearby tree and had skinned her. Brian just could not stop crying and Eric ran over to see what was wrong and just stood there jaw dropped and frozen. He then muttered, she was skinned alive, there's a bunch of bruising caused by struggling around her neck where the collar is. Shut up Eric, you ain't helping, I said as I put my shoulder around Brian who had unstrung his dog's body from the tree. Skinwalker, Eric said in a low tone of voice as he looked into the distance. He then screamed, it's a damn skinwalker. I followed his gaze and saw an animal that looked like Lucy but it had human eyes and a sickly green glazed looking coat of fur. Brian stopped crying and just stood their eyes locked on the beast. Eric then whispered with his voice quivering, we all run to the truck on a count of three. Just leave everything else. 
Brian and I slowly nodded and agreed to the plan. Okay, three, two, one. Eric whispered sharply and we all took off like a pack of gazelles for the truck. We hopped in and as soon as we did we saw the skinwalker lunge at the us and struck the right side door with a such a powerful blow that nearly tipped over the whole truck. It didn't stop me whatsoever and I drove out of there faster than I ever could have. After that, none of us ever went hunting again in that area. We never even went back to claim our camping trailers and supplies. It was too terrifying to think that what happened to Brian's dog could happen to us and that thing would walk around in our skin. Since that experience, I am now a superstitious person. Second story. This story was shared by you slash My boyfriend brought a skinwalker to my house. Ye nad dash. Natalie, I swear to God, if you say that word I'll kick you out of my car and leave you on the side of the road, Haley threatened. Ye nald lushiai is what I was trying to say to my friend Haley. In case you don't know what that is, that's the Navajo name for a skinwalker. I just found this out not too long ago, too. Skinwalkers are an interesting Navajo legend, basically, they're like shapeshifters. I know a lot of people who live out in the secluded countryside that have claimed to see them. I, personally, never saw one before. Not until my idiot boyfriend brought one to my house. Now, before my boyfriend told me about his skinwalker stalker, I had always teased Haley about them. We would drive through secluded areas at night, just for the thrill of what lies in the darkness but she wasn't a fan when I brought them up in her car. I'd make comments about them just to freak her out. Haley, what if we saw a deer standing on its hind legs in the field next to us? What if you saw yourself sprinting behind the car in the rear view mirror right now? Despite my teasing, I really did believe in skinwalkers. I've always believed in legends and supernatural beings like that, and it was interesting to learn about, not that I really did that much deep diving into the subject. But what I did learn freaked me out. You would think that would keep me from making jokes about it in prime skinwalker territory, but not all of us have that much common sense. I'm not the only one though. Like I had mentioned before, I don't believe my jokes are what brought one to my house. You see, my boyfriend lives out in the countryside, with lots of open space around him. He's always mentioned how he felt like something was stalking him out there, watching as he moved from his car to the house. He always kind of assumed it was some type of freaky animal. His suspicions were confirmed but it wasn't exactly what he thought it was. According to him, he saw a skinwalker in the field when he came home from my place one night. Gavin, come on. You didn't see a skinwalker. Nat, I'm telling you, most animals aren't that tall. And their eyes don't glow green. How much sleep did you get? He gave me a disapproving look. His claim was that the night before, when he got home, he saw a tall, looming creature watching him from the tree line with bright green and glowing eyes. Now, like I said, I do believe in skinwalkers, but my boyfriend also doesn't get much sleep, so of course I figured he was hallucinating something watching him. I wasn't hallucinating. There was a skinwalker at my place, and I saw him, and I literally almost pissed my pants. I promise, I wasn't imagining anything. I caved in and told him I believe him, and as long as he didn't conjure one up at my place that's all that mattered to me. Then we went to bed and never saw any skinwalkers again. That should have been the happy ending of this story, right? Nope. I really didn't think about it the next day. I mean, I live in a pretty busy area. It's not exactly where you would think most skinwalkers reside, 
but maybe some have a preference for bigger cities. More people to stock, I guess. Throughout the day, I had been cleaning the house, getting it ready for the week ahead. Since I work close to 40 hours a week, I really don't have much time to clean so I basically just do it when I can. Time flew by, and at 8.40 p.m. all I had to do was take out the trash. It's around the time of year where night falls pretty early, so I had to take the trash out in the dark. Normally that wouldn't really bother me, but because of my boyfriend's little tale that I happened to remember at that moment, it freaked me out. Just a little bit, not enough to piss my pants like some other people. When I stepped outside and heard a low growl, maybe that was closer to pissing my pants territory. My neighbors do have a little pit bull that they leave chained up outside, ridiculous, so I just blamed the noise on him. That's the most reasonable explanation, and to keep myself from freaking out, I had to stay reasonable. Then I saw the eyes. Not pit bull eyes. Not any dog's eyes. Nothing even remotely close to a normal animal or even human. And they weren't even green, so at least my boyfriend Skinwalker stayed behind. All I could see in the darkness of my neighbor's yard was two glowing red eyes. Maybe this was a good time to piss my pants, and God only knows I was close. I've always heard the term fight or flight, and I figured I would be a flight type of girl. I was right. I threw the bags on the ground and basically flung my body back to the front door, frantically trying to turn the knob to get it to open. I heard twigs break under someone's steps, and that's when I pissed my pants. I guess I am more of a baby than my boyfriend after all. The door slammed loudly behind me, but nothing could mask the growling noise I heard from the other side of the glass. Because it was so dark, I really couldn't make out more than a silhouette, but the silhouette was enough to make me go from pissing myself to shitting myself. The outline looked sort of, fuzzy, like it had some type of hair on its body. The worst part were its eyes, somehow they were even brighter than they were before, a piercing and sinister red. I had already locked the knob, thank God I formed that habit, but I needed to find my keys to fully lock the door. I didn't want to take my eyes off of whatever was on the other side of that glass, but I knew I had to. It had to be tonight that my keys weren't hanging on the hook where I usually kept them. I'll remember this the next time I toss them on my desk. When I turned back around from grabbing my keys, those glowing red eyes were no longer staring at me. Somehow that made this entire situation way worse. I needed to see where he was, where he was stalking me from. I couldn't really focus on that at the moment, so I hurried towards the door, locked it with my key, and closed the inside door. The windows were all closed and locked, so I knew that he couldn't get inside without me hearing some resistance. It took about three hours for me to finally calm down, but until then I kept my eyes open. I barely blinked until the stress from the situation turned into fatigue, and I could barely keep my eyes open. I didn't feel the same presence as I did while I was outside, so maybe that was a good sign, but I really didn't want to fall asleep. I felt vulnerable enough sitting in my bed, a hammer and mace next to me of course. But I did. I fell asleep, in my piss-soaked pants, might I add, and woke up the next morning, alive. I didn't feel alive. I felt like ten years had been taken off my life. But I was breathing and I wasn't hurt, not physically at least. Oh, shit. Gavin. I need to tell Gavin. 10.34 AM. He was probably asleep, but at that point I really didn't care, so I FaceTimed him. I saw myself in the front view camera. My eyes were bloodshot and puffy, probably from keeping them open for so long. 
I guess this kind of freaked Gavin out. Nat. What the hell? Did you dash? I know it's rude to interrupt, but I had to cut him off. I'm sure he probably didn't understand most of what I said considering I was basically racing through the story, but his face at the end of my story told me that he understood enough. And he actually believed me, probably because I looked like I had the life sucked out of me. I haven't felt the presence of that thing since that night, and it's been two nights since I saw those red eyes outside my door, but I have a feeling it isn't going to leave me alone forever. I just hope that next time I'll be prepared, even though it's pretty hard to prepare for a skinwalker attack. But if I do get attacked, blame my idiot boyfriend since he basically summoned it to my front door. Maybe I'll get him to kill it for me. Third story. This story was shared by you slash BR3K6N. My mother is a skinwalker. My name is Noah. I live in Miramar, Florida, but every winter we leave for Colorado to go skiing and celebrate Christmas. I live with my father, mother and younger brother, Tom. My family has always been a happy one but everything changed when we went to Colorado this winter. My mother was always a caring woman, she'd give constant hugs without any reasons with smiles brighter than the sun, and one thing for sure she loved her family. One very dark night in our the electricity went out and darkness was thick, as any normal people would we had some candles lit to provide us with some comfort of light. You'd have thought that people of our statue would have owned a generator right? But that's my father's fault, his procrastination caused that, he had been promising my mother an eternity that he'd have bought a generator. We were short on candles though so my father went and got his keys to drive in town for some supplies. Hoping that the lights would have came back by morning I went to my room to sleep it out. About 40 minutes in a sleep I heard my brother calling me from outside this was strange though as my younger brother was very afraid of the dark and his room was right next to mine. Noah. Come look at this, my brother hurled. I then got out of bed and checked my brother's room, because there was no way my little brother who was so terrified by darkness was outside, and there he was sleeping like an angel. Screak. The front door slowly opened I quickly ran downstairs to see who or what had opened door. I went to look downstairs when I barely glimpsed my mother's silhouette going through the door. I could hear her talking. Tom. Baby what are you doing outside? Come on in, she said. My brain went in shock as I knew that I couldn't be Tom as I had already checked. Just mere seconds later I heard the ear-hurting screams of my mother's voice, it felt like a knife was being jabbed in my ears. I ran to the the kitchen to grab the knife or something to help my mom. As I rushed out there to what was a gruesome sight. There was an inhumane creature devouring my mother, the stench was putrid and its eyes were as red as the devil's, its skin was like fur like that of a coyote and its mouth opened wide like around 25 inches or so. I stood there in shock, unable to move with what was supposed to be a weapon in my hand, a knife to be exact. But. Against this monster I guess a knife is useless. Flickering up to the cabin were my dad's car lights approaching, the creature then started contorting. It had changed into my mother's skin, looking exactly like her. My father pulled in the driveway and said. What are you guys doing out here? Oh hun, we were just talking, the creature said with my mother's beautiful voice. Dad, that's not Moem. Whatever that is IT isn't Moem, I shouted. What are you saying my son stop this nonsense, it said. My father simply shrugged me off saying I need to get back to sleep because I'm talking nonsense. I kept trying to warn him but he simply dismissed me and sent me to my room. 
For nights I couldn't sleep thinking of what I'd saw, it made me squeamish thinking of my mother's screams and how vile it was seeing that monster swallow my mother's body whole. It's been a year and that thing acts and behaves exactly like my mom. It has all my mother's memories. Everything. I've heard of skinwalker stories before so I now had an idea of what creature it was. Sometimes I wonder if it was all a dream, but if it's not, I know that out of everything I must protect my brother. At any cost. Anything. Fourth story. I think I encountered a skinwalker. I have no evidence, but I promise you all this story is real. Sorry for the wall of text. I've always been a bit of a skeptic, ever since I was a kid. Scary stories don't faze me, horror games never frighten me, and whenever I hear something weird at night, I instantly assume it's something normal, an animal or just the house settling. Despite this, something very unsettling happened to me the other day and I'm really not sure what to make of it. I think it's the first time in years I've been genuinely frightened. I live in a forested area, in the US. Me and my girlfriend live in a large cabin, and although there are roads nearby, our nearest neighbors are at least a kilometer away. We also have two cats, one of which sleeps in the bedroom with us, whilst the other often goes out at night and does whatever cats do when they're out of sight. Anyway. I like to stay up late at night and sleep late into the morning, whereas my girlfriend's an early bird. It was about 1 in the morning, and I was watching crappy TV in the living room whilst my girlfriend slept in the bedroom. I was beginning to grow tired when I heard something outside, near the cat flap. For clarity, our cat flap uses an electronic chip so only our cats can use it. I assumed it was just one of the cats coming into or leaving the house, and I ignored it. Then I heard it again. It sounded like something thudding against the flat. It happened several times at random intervals, until I lost my patience and decided to just go and open the door. Clearly the cat was having trouble getting in. I never thought about it at the time. But this was weird because we feed our cats well, and they're very lean rather than chubby. I passed the bedroom and peered in as I walked past, to see if my girlfriend heard the noises. She was fast asleep, but the cat that sleeps with us was staring at the window. I called her name. Nothing. She kept staring. I shrugged it off, and kept heading towards the kitchen. The back doors are through there, by the way. Anyway, so I reached the back door and saw a dark shape through the translucent flap. I sighed, expecting the cat to be out there, and opened the door. It took me a moment to open the door, and I saw the cat tense up as I opened the door. The door opened fully. I froze. It wasn't my cat. Whatever it was had started moving before I opened up, and I only caught a glimpse of a distorted figure, kind of like a tailless dog, bolting, and I mean absolutely pelting it. I freaked out and slammed the door shut. What the hell was it? I wasn't sure. My natural skepticism kicked in, and I assumed it was just my other cat, and I had merely startled it. Perhaps the darkness had made it appear larger. Nevertheless, I was creeped out, and decided to go to sleep. As I slipped into bed, I realized something horrifying, the second cat was asleep on the rug. It took a while to get to sleep that night. Everything seemed normal until a few hours later. I awoke to a strange feeling of dread. Something wasn't right. My girlfriend was fast asleep. I held my breath, and heard something creaking by the door. It sounded too loud to be one of the cats. It was as if, a person was walking about. 
I reached towards my bedside cabinet and flicked on the lamp. The room was illuminated, and I saw something standing just outside the open door. Staring at me. The same twisted figure I had spotted outside earlier. It wasn't very tall, maybe a little over five feet, but it was its face that scared me the most. I only caught a glimpse of it, but what I saw will stay with me forever. It looked like a dog, but with an elongated face, and almost human-like eyes. You know that weird distorted snarl hounds pull when they're pissed off. It had that expression. I instantly started yelling profanities as I scrabbled backwards, trying to straighten up. The creature turned and sprinted down the hall. I heard it dash outside and go past the window behind us, just above the headboard. I managed to look out as my girlfriend started to panic as she woke up fully. We both caught a glimpse of, whatever the hell this thing was as it dashed off into the woods near our home. Grabbing my trusty shotgun from beneath the bed, as well as a couple rounds from the ammunition box that sits next to it, I ran out of the room in my underwear and rounded into the kitchen. The door was open. I'd forgotten to lock it when I saw the thing originally. I haven't seen it since, and we still live in our cabin, but I've bought sturdy locks for all of the main doors and windows in the house, and always check the exit points at night. I also go to bed a bit earlier than I used to, so I'm asleep when the freaks of the night start to wake up. I've read a bunch of forums, and the only thing I can compare it to, based on what I saw, is a skinwalker. If you know anything about these things, please let me know. Edit, I wrote daughter by mistake. Sorry about that. I don't actually have a daughter. Also, for those who are asking, I'm originally from England then moved overseas later on in life. I've always preferred using kilometers as I just find them easier to use. And any spelling mistakes are just me being an idiot who can't spell. Fifth story. This story was shared by you slash Jacob LMAO. Smiling Skinwalker. I've had a draft of this story set up for a while but I've been too worried and scared to tell. It made me question, everything. My faith, my eyes, my sanity. I've decided it's time to finally let others know about what I've experienced, as it may help me move on. At least that's what I hope. I recently moved westward to Arizona from the boring state of Oklahoma. I am a devout Christian, and never once before this had I believed there were entities in existence that we couldn't hunt down with our modern advancements. It's 2019 for heaven's sake. You'd figure if we wanted to find something, we would and most of all, we could. It was the 23rd of December, 2018. I was in Payson, Arizona, a bit north of Phoenix. My friends and I, in our Christmas spirit, decided to head out north of town, about five to six miles or so into the forest on a secluded trail. It was cold that night, some of my friends shivered and displayed obvious signs of unpreparedness. I was layered fairly well, and yet the winds and frigid cold punctured through my layers and onto me. We wanted to make a bonfire, warm up, enjoy ourselves and a few drinks. I knew as soon as I got into the car to head that way, something was off. I felt sick, uneasy, and something in my gut told me to just stay home. But I couldn't put my finger on just what, and ignored my ever so looming feelings of anxiety. We picked up friends and headed to the trail. I'm a huge nature lover, and always felt safe in the confines of the forest, I felt in control, at ease. But not tonight. It may sound cliché but, I'll be damned if it didn't feel like someone, or something was watching me when we finally got there. 
And when I had gotten far enough down the trail that turning back would be no hasty endeavor, it finally hit me why I felt so eerie. That same year, during the weeks prior to Thanksgiving, I was here before. It's not a spot we usually go to, therefore I was not familiar with it, nor were my friends. We were coming out for the same reason we were in December, for a few drinks around a bonfire. It was late. I however, hadn't had any spirits that night. It was my job to gather firewood. I didn't mind, my chance to survey and explore the area around us wouldn't be bad. Before I even left our area, things took a turn for the strange. I was at the edge of the light being cast from the small bonfire I was to gather more fuel for. In the faint glow of the far trees, I caught glimpse of something dark behind a tall pine. I asked backwards to my friends if it was out of the ordinary for people to be hanging around this spot. My query was only met with silence from them, as they drank on. I took a few more steps beyond the comfort of the blaze, keeping my eyes affixed on the tall shadowy figure fixated behind the tall trees. I could faintly make out that it had moved in a slight bobbing motion, like a buoy upon a tide. My immediate thoughts drew a blank as to why someone would be out here doing this. Maybe I was seeing things, or it was a prank of some sort. I opened my mouth to call out, or even crack a joke, but was mortified when I realized I could not speak. Something inside of me prevented me of making any noise. My heart raced. As it swiftly came, it shot off into the distance like a bullet. Being startled so badly, I fell back onto the ground and kicked myself back like a spooked animal scratching and cutting my hands as I do so. My friends saw me and laughed, thinking I was drunk. I managed to stammer out a line to what I saw, but was only met with a few blank stares and laughs making me sound stupid. For the rest of the night, I never dared step away from the beams of the bonfire. As I walked down that trail that frigid December evening, I remember what I had seen and felt on that cold November night and my stomach dropped. My friends were slurring out Christmas carols and other drunk epiphanies. I know they wouldn't listen to me even if I spoke out, so I ignored the guttural feelings, prayed for the best and walked on. I hadn't been drinking much this night either. I don't enjoy alcohol as much as my friends, and often I was the one responsible for hurting them home when the night was over. However, to calm my tense nerves, I had a drink or two from some Jaeger we had chilled in the ice chest. It was Christmas after all. It worked. We were all having a good time, enjoying our festive feelings and generally savoring the crisp forest atmosphere. Soon, nature called and forgetting my prior ordeal, I began to walk away from the fire to relieve myself. I walked a fair 300 or so feet away towards a big rock resting behind some fallen trees, not wanting to be seen doing my business. I was not even far enough away from the fire to not be able to hear my friend's voices echoing through the woodlands. From behind me, my friend Corbin who had come along, called out my name. I'll admit, I was tipsy, but nowhere near enough to not differentiate reality from a drunken stupor. I remember calling out to him, telling him to give me a moment to finish. I zipped up and turned to walk around the rock to where I heard him wonder to. I don't know what it was, but sure as all heaven above and hell below was not Corbin. It took me a minute for my woozy mind to put this together and stop walking towards it. I am thankful I did. This being stood tall, at least six to seven feet. Its eyes burned like our fire. It moved from a dog-like four-limb position to standing tall. The light from the moon on this cold night radiated the body showing off its dark slender shape with an inhumane sheen. I began to sob. 
violently. My mind ran in panicked circles. Seconds felt like lifetimes as my world ground to a halt at the clawed feet of the beast that I was sure was going to take my life from me right then and there. I did the only thing I could think to do. I dropped to my knees and began to pray. This monster to my petrified brain had to have been the devil himself, to imagine him anything worse than it would be impossible. It did not like my pleas to God. An unholy shriek of what I can only think to describe as someone screaming loudly with lungs full of water rang out. I screamed in terror and with all the strength I could muster, lunged backwards across the forest floor, running as fast as my legs could take me. I fell a few times. I think, in sheer panic. I just couldn't manage to get my body to work properly knowing that thing was near. When I returned in a panicked craze to the fire, covered in sweat, dirt and tears, I managed to wheeze out what happened somewhat through my sobs of fear. I could tell they doubted whether or not what I was desperately stammering out was real or not. I think I was so horrified in that moment that I had a small seizure, because everything else is a blur. I remember going to the truck, leaving. I remember waking up the next day receiving a multitude of texts saying I was either stupid and crazy, or texts from worried friends asking if I was okay. And I also remember the last I saw of the thing before I made my frenzied flee. When it smiled back at me through the forest and skittered off into the darkness. A few days after Christmas, I was able to get in touch with a native elder here in town. I was so scared mentioning the event because I was worried of being mocked or him not believing me. To a twist of my thinking, I told him very vividly what I had encountered. He wholeheartedly believed and told me he it was a skinwalker. He then blessed me thoroughly and told me to leave that stretch of land alone and to never venture out there again. Next time I might not be so lucky. He didn't have to tell me twice. I know, I know I sound crazy. If I were you, I wouldn't believe me either. But you don't have to. All you have to know is, for the love of God above and all things holy, never forget that we are not alone on this earth. Sometimes during the night, whenever I look out my window, I catch sight of eyes in the trees looking back at me. Sixth Story this story was shared by you slash Anakin Winters. Skinwalkers need friends too. Northern Canada would get so cold in the winter that it was almost impossible for cars to function. So, my family became very skilled hunters. We would have a hearty meal of deer or rabbit every night and we learned to grow vegetables indoors for a little bit of freshness in our Viking-like diet. I was around 15 when I first started to hunt alone, and I was 18 when this happened. It was early in the morning and I was tracking rabbits. I had found a nice spot near a rabbit den and bundled up, gun raised, ready to shoot. Something felt off though. It took a minute before I realized, the forest was dead quiet. No chickadees, no coyotes howling, no wind. Nothing. It was if all the creatures in the wild disappeared. As weird as it was, I paid no mind to it and chalked it up to being too cold for animals to be out and about, though that didn't explain the lack of wind and no leaves rustling. I lay in the snow for another 16 minutes before giving up and deciding to set off a different location. Just as I slung my gun over my shoulder, I glanced to the side and froze. A large black dog stood around ten feet away from me. The dog had on a collar, so I assume it was tamed. But the nearest house was an hour away and it made no sense that a dog would be out here. Are you lost boy? I asked casually, not at the time taking into account how wrong it was for a dog to be all the way out here. Is your owner here? 
The dog just stared. Its eyes were milky and I felt as if they were boring into my skull. I approached the dog and held my hand out for it to sniff it. The dog didn't move, it didn't flinch and its tail didn't wag. I drew my hand back and rummaged through my coat pocket. I pulled out a piece of deer jerky my father had steamed during the week. I snapped it in half and offered the piece to the dog. It took the piece in its teeth before swallowing it whole. I laughed nervously as the dog licked its chaps. Hungry huh? What are you doing out here? I knelt down and stroked the dog's head. Its coat was freezing, like the dog had frostbite or fell in a river, but somehow wasn't wet. Its milky white eyes stared into me still, at the time I assumed it was cataracts. A bark came from the left of me, and both me and the dog turned to look. An entire pack of dogs stood in the clearing, all with milky white eyes and black fur. Chills ran down my spine, but still, being a stupid teenager, I just thought it was just a trait of that breed. The dog looked back at me and licked my hand with a tongue that felt like ice before running over to the group. I watched as the pack moved on. The largest dog's eyes lingered on me, before following the others. I watched as they ran off out of the clearing. It was like a reset mode as soon as they left because the forest came back to life. I could hear shikadees, the rustle of wind through leaves and the scattering of nearby rabbits and shrews. I shot three rabbits and headed home, still curious about the dogs. A week later I asked why dad about it, but he said that the neighbor's dog, Sombra, had been missing for months and everyone else either didn't have a dog that matched my description, or just didn't have a dog in general. I thought that was very unnerving and didn't hunt for a while after that. The next time I saw the dog it was early spring. I didn't have school to attend until the fall, so I just helped out at home and read and raised chickens. One Monday, both my parents were in Calgary visiting friends, and my brother was sick downstairs watching Game of Thrones, so I was pretty much alone. I sat in the library, reading and sipping some sweet Earl Grey tea. The rain was in a full-out downpour, so the chores I could carry out were mainly indoors and quick to complete. Scratching came at the door, causing the hair on my neck to stand up. We didn't own any animals that could scratch. Scared and curious, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and opened the door. The black dog stood there, its familiar milky eyes staring into my soul. I jumped in surprise at first, but quickly smiled at the thought that the dog came all the way from the woods to my house, hey bud. I said bending down and petting its frosty skin. How did you find me? It was the lavender, wasn't it? I joked, referring to the essential oil I always had on my hunting gloves and wrists. I could have been mistaken, but I swore the dog nodded its head slightly. Where are your friends? I asked, my brother loves dogs, we could all play a game of ultimate frisbee. The dog blinked up at me in an almost amused manner. It nudged my arm with its cold nose. Do you want jerky bud? I asked. The dog blinked. All right then. Wait here. I walked to the pantry and grabbed a bag of jerky before returning to the dog. I once again, snapped a piece of jerky in half and gave the half to the dog. It swallowed it whole like it did the first time and just sort of wandered back into the tree lean that I laughed to myself and the rest of the day went by normally. I awoke that night with fear in my chest. It felt as if I was being watched. Slowly, I sat up and peeked through the curtains. My breath hitched. A woman stared back at me. She stood in the tree lean completely naked. 
She looked Native American but with milky white skin that almost glowed in the moonlight. Her black hair was in two long braids. I felt my world crash around me as I stared into her big, white milky eyes. Just like the dogs, I realized. The woman caught my gaze through the window and smiled. It sent chills into my heart. She walked to the window, almost as if approaching an old friend and tapped onto the glass. I don't know why I did, but I opened the window out of pure curiosity. Um, are you okay lady? I asked, trying not to sound fearful. She just nodded and said something in a language that I couldn't pin down. I caught, nighttime, and, forest, so it may have been Cree, but it sounded so, ancient. Do you want me to call the police? She cocked her head to the side. I take it she couldn't understand the question. She took me by surprise when she took hold of my wrist and put a feather into my hand. Her hands were so cold that I shivered. Then she just turned and ran back into the woods. I awoke the next morning convinced that it was a dream, but I turned to find the feather on my dresser. I haven't seen the dog for a year now and I have no idea why the woman came to my window. I still have the feather and I still wear lavender oil. I don't know why the woman and the dog had the same eyes, but after doing some research, I learned about skinwalkers and I feel that that is what I encountered. But they weren't malevolent in any way, and I never felt threatened, only a bit uneasy and cold. And I don't know if this is related in any way, but I often find little presents on my windowsill like rabbit skin and my parents are curious why dead owls keep appearing on the porch. Seventh story. This story was shared by you slash misu underscore am. A skinwalker is knocking on my door. I am writing this now as a call for help, I am desperate and I don't know what to do. My name is Michael, I own a dairy farm in the Great Plains, near a Navajo reservation along with my brother. The farm was built by our parents before we were born and it was passed down to us after their death. It's a pretty big farm, it has two barns, a well and a house, where we spend most of our free time, although I've always dreaded this place, because it's the place where our parents died, or at least where they were found them why parents died when we were both 19, their bodies were found mutilated in the well, there was nothing stolen or destroyed. If not for the blood trail leading to the well we would have never found them the case was passed as a murder, but they never had any suspects, and me and. My brother were too ravaged by the event to think about it. Years passed and we forgot about the event, well until two weeks ago. We were gathering food for the cows using an old tractor, it was pretty dark but we didn't use its headlights because the battery was too old and couldn't stand them being on for very long. As I was loading up the food I heard my mom's voice calling for me from behind some bushes, Michael, it's been too long come to me, but it sounded weird, as if it was spoken through an old radio. I was terrified, I looked at my brother and he was as white as snow. I whispered to him to turn on the headlights in the direction of the voice. What laid before our eyes made my knees weak, it was a coyote, but its eyes were pitch black and it was standing on its back legs. I jumped in the tractor and we noped our way out of there as fast as we could. We arrived at the house and locked the door, that's the moment when I passed out. I woke up in the middle of the night, I thought all that just happened was a dream but then I saw my brother telling me to stay quiet and pointing his shotgun at the door. Then I heard it again, Michael, come here my dear. Then it started to knock softly on the door, that didn't last for very long though. The knocking turned into banging, then my brother started looking through the window at that thing. It realized we were looking at it and it let out the most horrific screech I've ever heard, before it ran off. An hour later it started again, 
the voice and the knocking. I've searched it up on the internet and I learned they are called skinwalkers, evil Navajo men that sold their soul. Calling their name supposedly attracts them, I hope writing it doesn't trigger them. My brother wants to go outside and face it, I'm afraid we won't see the light of day again, please help us. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.